Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Harnessing Public Health and Human Services Systems to Create an Equitable and Resilient Nation, co-hosted by the National Academy of Public Administration and the American Public Human Services Association. Before we start, we're gonna go over a few logistics for today's webinar. Uh, first off, I wanna let everybody know that attendees are automatically muted when joining the webinar. Uh, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to uh, ask any questions that you have during the webinar. Uh, as well, uh, I wanna flag for everybody that this, this webinar is being recorded and a copy of the event will be shared to everybody via email after today's webinar. Uh, Q&As will be responded to at the end of today's session after we go through our uh, roundtable uh, discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Terry Gurdon, President and CEO of the National Academy of Public Administration for some opening remarks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am really delighted to welcome you to what promises to be a great conversation today, co-hosted by the National Academy of Public Administration and the American Public Human Services Association. Today marks the first of what we expect to be several conversations where we will look into ways that we can leverage the current public human services system in America to help us address systemic issues of social and racial equity. But before we get into the discussion, I wanna give you a little background. In November of 2019, NAPA identified 12 grand challenges in public administration. We wanted to name the big issues of our time, creating a decade long work agenda. And we specifically wanted to focus on what public administrators can do to address them. So when you check out the list on our website, you'll see topics like create modern water systems for safe and sustainable use, connect individuals to meaningful work, make government AI ready, and build resilient communities on the list. We believe that the levers of progress on each of these grand challenges are firmly in the hands of public administrators at every level of government. And those levers include laws and regulations, budgets, processes and procedures, citizen engagement and public governance, grants and performance measures, all of the grand challenges are interrelated, but perhaps none is more central than the grand challenge to foster social equity. Social equity is one of the pillars of public administration, along with economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. And Napa has a standing panel of fellows that focus on social equity and governance. But last year, the Academy, like the country, saw plainly through the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic and the protests for racial justice across the country, both how poorly we've addressed systemic issues of equity, but how urgently we need to address them. Government programs that provide what we know as public human services are inefficient by their very design. Historically, they've been stovepiped in funding and in management and measurement, and too often they're focused on outputs and not outcomes. And we know these design flaws have far too often had a disproportionate and cumulative impact on communities of color. So we hope this series of conversations enables a new way of thinking about human services that acknowledges and identifies inequities, examines where and why they exist, and shows a path forward so that leaders at all levels of government can work in coordination with their communities to reshape these critical services so that they deliver fair and equitable outcomes in the future. This is a vital role for public administrators, and I wanna thank you for joining us on this journey. And now I am delighted to turn the program over to Tracy Waring Evans, a fellow of our Academy and president and CEO of the American Public Human Services Association. Tracy. Well, thanks so much, Terry, for providing that opening context. And it's just been an honor to partner with you on this uh, kickoff webinar for the series. And we're certainly excited to have such a great blend of federal, state, local, academia, philanthropy, community-based, and private partners with us today on this webinar. So hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Waring Evans, President and CEO of the American Public Human Services Association. And I'll be moderating our session today with our distinguished panelists. As Terry so aptly noted, to build communities where we all have the opportunity to live our fullest lives we must tackle disparities and inequities at the very root. 
looking intentionally at policies, people, and delivery systems that form the brick and mortar to building equitable opportunities. And for those of us working in human services, we know the pivotal role that human services system should and must play. Human services provide access to quality childcare, education, and healthcare. They assure food and housing security. They promote opportunities to earn family sustaining wages and accumulate savings. They connect people to support systems that stress, that reduce our stress and so much more. In short, human services are a critical part of our core infrastructure. At APHSA, we refer to human services as the cornerstone to creating healthy, equitable, and resilient communities. We believe that public leaders working alongside our community and private partners can harness human services to work synergistically with our broader health and economic infrastructure so that all communities can thrive. And to do so, we know we must lay new tracks that connect generations of families, especially among black, brown, and indigenous Americans to opportunities that increase intergenerational mobility and rates of upward mobility. Our call to action at APHSA to advance race equity, like NAFA's social equity grand challenge, must be infused in all we do. And I'll share up front that our focus on advancing race equity is not to the exclusion of other groups that have been harmed, but because we believe by first illuminating structural root causes um, of race inequity within the context of human services, we can drive broader inoculating changes for other structural inequities, such as socioeconomic status, disabilities, gender identity, and sexual orientation. So we hope um, with all of you over the next hour or so, we'll explore what it takes to do this from the experience and perspectives of three amazing leaders. We're gonna take it in three parts, taking first a look back at what has got us to today, a little bit of a historical perspective, then take a deeper dive into the real-time lessons from the past year and the impact of COVID-19. And finally, we'll look ahead to opportunities on the horizon and what can be. We're gonna focus on how federal and state policy is being translated into solutions on the ground to tackle the most pressing social and economic needs of families. And we're gonna explore what's needed for our human services systems to become more proactive in preventing issues before they happen and helping families succeed for the long term. So I encourage you as Matt did at the beginning of the webinar to capture your questions along the way. You can put them in the Q&A function at any time. Um, we have built in time uh, for us to come back for audience Q&A at the end of the session. So um, please uh, capture those and don't lose them. So I'm gonna get us started and introduce our panel. We have with us uh, Duke Storen, who's the commissioner of the Virginia Department of Social Services. Duke also happens to chair APHSA's Leadership Council and serves on our board of directors. And for that, we're very grateful. Uh, Antonia Jimenez is the Director of Los Angeles County Department of Public Social Services. Antonia is a leading voice in innovation of human services and a member of our local council. She also serves on the Leadership Council with Duke. And Jody Sanford is the Dean of the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington and a Napa Fellow, as Terry mentioned. I've had the honor of getting to know and work alongside Jody during her previous tenure. Uh, at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. She's a steward of whole family approaches that keep equity at the center of our collective work, as you'll soon hear. So I'm gonna turn us to uh, a conversation about how we got to today. Um, and I'll, I'll start with a bit of a meta look, um, but I'll ask this question of all three of our panelists. And as we think about coming together today and the, the challenges that our nation faces, um, we know that some of these are new, um, but many in, uh, have evolved over decades um, and even centuries um, in the making. Learning from our past and understanding how it influences our present, I'd like to hear from each of you about what are some of the most critical longstanding issues that human service agencies can impact through a policy agenda focused on promoting a more just and equitable society. And Jody, I'll kick it off to you. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I'm grateful to be here and joining everyone. You know, this question about root causes to me is essential to start with. Um, and, you know, when we teach graduate students in this space, we always talk about the fact that 
our country kind of built a system based on two kinds of people, deserving poor and undeserving poor. And that means we have created really an institutionalized patchwork system for the people that were de deemed not worthy. Um, and I think people in our system of human services have had to deal with that legacy and really try to make the best of some fundamental principles that uh, deemed certain people not as legitimate to getting equitable treatment by human services. And what I think is this moment is to deal with that legacy, um, look at the racial bias in our system, look at the other kinds of biases that are kind of baked in, um, and there's no more important time to do it, right? So from the economists will tell us that we have not been at such a time of in, income inequality in more than a century. Um, and we've learned a lot about the consequences of this system on people's lives. So I do a lot of work in the space for um, looking at how the bureaucracy functions. And we know that people learn from their encounters with the public administrative system. They learn about being excluded. They learn about being second-class citizens. And in fact, there's a whole area of work that's been developed around understanding the consequences of administrative burden um, and that people have to disproportionately learn how do they navigate these systems we've created? How do they comply with the rules and their incredible psychological and social costs? So. I think the federal government at this moment in time must partner with state and local government to really modernize the system. This means investing in basic IT infrastructure. It means supporting human-centered redesign of services and programs and really building out the capability to deliver on an equity promise rather than just being accountable. Because I think we've built a system that's really focused only on accountability rather than as much as we need to, to address this legacy from the past. Thanks a lot, Jody. Very helpful. Um, Duke, let's go to you from a, a, you've obviously served in multiple perspectives, but from a state perspective. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, I mean, I would like to build a little bit on what Jody said. You know, I think we have uh, created a patchwork system of uh, income support and other types of support uh, programs, nutrition, housing, um, access to health care. Um, and, you know, at the, at the bottom uh, of all of them, when looking at the outcomes we seek, um, is the experience of poverty that we have. Um, and I think if we are going to be intentional about addressing structural inequities, we've got to keep uh, poverty square and the focus of, uh, of the solutions that we want to create. I mean, we've got uh, multi-generational poverty. You know, Raj Chetty's work shows that the neighborhoods uh, in which people live really impact their life outcomes. Um, and some have very little intergenerational mobility, if any. And I think any federal response uh, from a policy standpoint that takes an equity lens we're gonna to have to be willing to invest disproportionately in neighborhoods and in individuals uh, that are at higher concentrations of poverty. Um, and I think the other uh, side of, uh, or the other impact of poverty that has been a longstanding challenge for state and local human service systems really is food and nutrition insecurity. You know, we've only had the uh, measure around since 1995 but we know that hunger has been a persistent problem in our nation's history, and we know it uh, disproportionately impacts black and brown families. And we have created structures um, that are not improving our uh, food security system. So we, we need some bold federal leadership to do something different than the patchwork of nutrition programs that we have today. Um, I think if we can if we can tackle poverty uh, and be less paternalistic and address food and nutrition insecurity, some of the other uh, longstanding human service challenges will uh, dramatically improve health outcomes, school readiness, school success, um, to name a couple. Thank you. Thanks, Duke. Antonia. Sure. Um, I want to start by just echoing what uh, Jody said because I feel like the the health and human service systems are 
uh, for the poorest of the poor and not even for the working poor. Um, because the amount, like if you get a dollar minimum wage increase, you might be able to lose a lot of your benefits, but you're still not a family that's stabilized and that has the ability uh, to maintain themselves. So I think government at all levels uh, needs to focus less on the specific rules, look at people holistically, what are the issues and the challenges that families are having, what are the impediments for uh, helping families uh, become more uh, economically and financially stable. And when we look at the system across the board, they're so silo that you can run your program, but you have no impact what running your program has on another program. You know, so, so you know, and when we look at food insecurity, which is one of the things um, that Duke mentioned, it's important to notice that, you know, we have to applaud the federal government uh, during this pandemic because not only did they increase the emergency allotments um, for depending on family size, they're going to have a 15% increase in, in, um, in uh, uh, benefits, but they're also working on students. But it took this pandemic to realize that, you know, we've all known we had a food insecurity issue um, and we talk about it, but we don't do anything about it. And so I think that now that we've done all of these changes, we have to make sure we don't lose and the progress that we made and that we actually build on the momentum that we have and that we don't set back after to the pre-pandemic days. So I would say that families need to be looked at holistically. Um, we need to look at programs across the board and we need to make sure that we understand the true needs of the family and that we hear from them. We think we know, we might not know. And so it's a voice to bring the communities into the decision-making process so that they can tell us exactly what they need so that we can help them. Thanks, Antonia. That's super helpful. And I think building on um, what all three of you said, really centering um, uh, people um, and family, um, their, uh, their expertise um, uh, of what they need and how do we create um, our systems, right, um, to, to advance that interconnected uh, place um, with uh, where where anyone um, lives their lives, right? So we often talk about social determinants of of health and well being, and yet we haven't really centered our systems um, to to recognize that. And I think building on all of your comments, and I'll I'll, I'll ask this question of Duke um, as we think about um, how pervasive the intergenerational um, wealth gap and housing. Um, and, and all of the pieces you spoke about with respect to poverty are among um, communities of color. Um, you shared some ideas around kind of federal policy um, and what we can do to counteract these longstanding inequities, but you wanna go a little bit deeper and then also maybe speak a little bit to the leadership um, roles that are required across levels of government to achieve that. Sure, Tracy, thank you. Yeah, I, I do think federal policy has come up short um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a nice litany of uh, examples. Um, one is the minimum wage, which hasn't kept pace with inflation, which has uh, significantly hurt um, low-income uh, workers and continues to drive the wedge uh, of income inequality. Um, the failure to expand the EITC to make more families uh, eligible, um, expand the child tax credit, um, not updating the thrifty food plan. Um, you know, uh, when I used to work at USDA, you know, we couldn't talk about taking the, then it was the food stamp, now the SNAP challenge where someone actually tried to live, even though it's supposed to be supplemental, tried to live on the allotment, um, which, is, which is almost impossible. Um, not updating an alternative measure of poverty. You know, our measure of poverty does not account for the true cost of living in communities. Um, it should vary by locality, and, uh, and there's a lot of alternatives out there, and there's no reason uh, that we can't have a true assessment of whether or not people can meet their basic human needs and live a life of dignity. I think the TANF time limit and focused on work first and the use of the participation rate calculation and caseload reduction credit is really a failure. TANF has not uh, been a success. Um, the reduction in roles are because states haven't increased the income threshold, 
not because people are better off earning a living wage. Um, not making the nutrition program supporting seniors as entitlements like they are for child nutrition. Um, so we have a growing senior population and we have capped funding for congregate meals and home delivered meals. Uh, it's a complete uh, ostrich uh, um, approach to public policy for seniors where we stick our head in the sand and pretend like nothing is wrong. A lack of flexibility and the allowable uses of administrative dollars across these different programs. Um, you know, Antonio talked about how uh, the interaction between programs um, is really difficult for families to mediate. You know, we need to take a whole family approach, but we need the flexibility to make that happen, to make joint investments in systems um, and in people uh, that foster collabor collaboration. And I think, you know, the benefit cliff is real. You know, we have evaluated, we have demonstrated, we have graphed it for years. Time to do something about the benefit cliff, uh, not just tell people that it's out there and counsel them about what's going to happen when they earn a higher wage. So, I, you know, I think at this time, the type of leadership we need uh, is leaders who are willing to foster innovation and recognize that equity is very different than equality. And they have to be willing to invest in people and communities in different ways based on need. You know, in the 1990s, the federal government pushed innovation using the demonstration and waiver authority. You know, uh, in 1115 of the Social Security Act is still around. And it's not just about Medicaid and Medicaid work requirements. It impacts all of the programs. Um, and then the Food and Nutrition Act for SNAP has similar authority. So we got PRORA, you know, Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act and the Workforce Investment Act and other landmark legislation um, coming out of some of those experiments in states. I think we need that level of bold innovation focused on equity and a willingness, our federal partners, to try something new. Because if we just keep operating the programs the way we are, we're not going to achieve our objectives. Thanks. Thank you, Duke. Um, that was a, a really impressive and comprehensive, although I'm sure we could add to it um, list. And so I will give Antonio or Jody anything you want to add um, that that was sparked by that comment from Duke. I do want to add the administrative complexity across our programs, you know, uh, so healthcare is a right. So you only have to do your renewals once a year. But food doesn't seem to be right. And food, you have to constantly do your semi-annual renewals every six months to demonstrate that you still are eligible to receive these benefits. And I think that you know um, the food and the food insecurity should demonstrate to us that all of these administrators that we put on uh, uh, all of these administrative burdens that we put on families are not really helping us with the food food insecurity. And we should look at the programs across the board. Uh, because we're asking the same families to provide all of this paperwork and all of this renewals time and time again, and really don't understand. And, and it's a burden for them to maintain and keep going. And, you know, these are working families who are getting dollars and you know, they, they don't want to have to miss a day of work because they failed to submit a documentation that the federal government requires. So I think we just have to look at it holistically. Thanks a lot, Antonia. Um, so, uh, Jody, I'll let you chime in if you've got additional pieces, but I'll also ask you the next question, and that way you can combine them if you um, if you want to. Um, so, just shifting, still kind of thinking about where we've been, right? Um, th moving to practice um, and and considering um, that we want to promote a system that is truly inclusive and effective and equitable. Um, we know that those human services policies, as Antonia just really um, said so well, must be anchored in human-centered and culturally appropriate practices that are informed by the lived expertise of our people serving systems. And so I think from, from where you sit, how are human service agencies evolving in the way they deliver services and supports to reflect this? And what challenges must we confront in both the top management and front lines of staff in doing that? I love these questions because I focus my work in policy implementation and we have created this massive complexity that you can't implement. 
If I was sitting in the federal government, one of the things I would just want to say in reaction to this question is you have to appreciate how people have been trying to make this patchwork system work. If I think about how many philanthropic investments have been invested in things like simulations so that middle class people can try to navigate the poverty infrastructure, you know, with this amount of money and this amount of public benefit. People go through these things through churches, through community groups, and they get shocked and they get stunned, but then there's been no policy change, right? And so Antonia is talking about, and Trace, you said as well, grounding this in family need. We know how to do that with human-centered design and backward mapping practices. And yet we have created a system where the people who are most knowledgeable at trying to center family needs are the frontline staff. And those are the people that we take so much attention to controlling their discretion and not rewarding their whole family orientation, right? It's created in many people that their mindset is just to implement one of the programs following the regulatory in a regulatory compliance way. And the workers who don't do that managers know are doing wonderful work, but they always feel like they're working outside of their job. And so what if we centered people who do work that keep the needs of whole families and, and are able to find those resources to support them? So some things that are evolving and I think have been really promising, one of them is actually work that APHSA has done around articulating the human-centered uh, value curve. It's a simple tool. It's a heuristic. We've taught it for the last few years in graduate school because it just helps people say, these visions are a big thing, but how do you move systems from a regulatory to a collaborative, to an integrative, to a generative kind of business model? That language and clarity about what we mean operationally is a really important advance. I also think that this council that Antonio has been connected to, which are the local program administrators and leaders from across the state, they show how they try to make new policy programs are keeping whole families. Um, they're, they're trying to innovate, but what I've seen is that the resources to support that leadership are really scarce and the waivers to allow them to innovate on whole families are really scarce. So we need to leverage local governments to be learning labs and really allow them to do what they wanna do for families rather than being accountable to these outdated systems. And then finally, I think Policy, um, as I said, directs people, and Duke said this as well, to be expert in something very, very narrow. We need to support the new practice models that are developing that overcome this kind of categorical um, thinking and really allow people to do what they want to do. It's why they went into this field, but the current system inhibits them from doing that. Thanks a lot, Jody. And I the, noticed in the chat, I think the the points really around, and, and I know we all probably feel like we're talking to the choir with each other around this, but the points really around whole family approach and centering family um, and recognizing that our conversations about it haven't yet um, impacted in the ways we want to is I think um, resonating um, with the audience. Uh, and so certainly we can maybe dig a little bit deeper into that as we think about when we get to the points of looking ahead, how do we really do that? But let's let's turn now to um, kind of the here and now or the experience of the last year um, in a um, in a global pandemic that I think um, you know we can we, there's lots of conversation we can have around it, but let's kind of center that in um, specifically and how much it has, um, revealed what so many folks in the human services and human serving systems knew that structural inequities um, have uh, been, you know, embedded in our systems. They um, manifest themselves even more um, uh, in, in illuminated ways in a crisis. And when we think about the disproportionate health and economic impacts of the pandemic, um, we 
Um, also know that it's not just in the immediate here and now. Um, many of those families um, are first affected and also last to recover. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to hear, Antonia, from your perspective about the ways in which um, you see human services playing a pivotal role in both mitigating the disparate impact of the pandemic right now and promoting an equitable recovery and maybe sharing some of your own experiences there in LA. So I always say never waste a crisis. Um, um, taking this opportunity to really redesign our business model um, using the technology that we have in hand to make sure that customers can call us from wherever they are and apply for benefits. And we're about to launch our May, May 8th, March 8th, the same thing for renewals. So, so that people don't have to worry about, they can just call us and renew. So we're, we're fixing our business models to make it easier for families uh, to get the benefits that they deserve. But I also think we need to look at it from, and I like what, um, what Duke said on the benefit cliff, because you know a family of four in TANF in California once they make over $2,450, they're off the TANF rolls. And um, $1,800 or $2,000 of that goes to pay rent. So um, it doesn't mean that they're going to be able to survive. And so we're looking at ways in that we can have some flexibility in the funding that we have to make sure that we're putting the supports around the families so that we can even blend funding from the, you know, the, the homeless um, dollars and um, the ten of dollars, and you know, making sure they get the maximum they get on the on the cow fresh. But I think that we need to continue to push the envelope. We can get the operational business processes right, um, but just because it's quicker and easier to get benefits doesn't mean it's getting you the benefits that you really need in order to um, make sure your family is stable. So that's kind of the direction that we're looking at. How can we um, um, be flexible in how we use our dollars? to families have the supports that they need. Thanks, that's really helpful to hear the on the ground um, experience and the ways in which you're thinking about moving forward, Antonia. Um, Duke, or, uh, Duke or Jody, anything you wanna add um, on that point or, or even to the point of how we are translating um, what, what, federal what the federal response has been um, into action on the ground? I guess Duke has probably some insight on here. I just want to frame for people. Antonio and Duke are talking about more flexibility. Sometimes people have felt like, of course, that's what you would expect state and local leaders to say. I think I want to make sure the federal people understand that the reason why this is a solution goes back to what Duke was saying earlier. We need innovation so that we can see what works for systems redesign. It's not something we can do from the top down. We must do it from the bottom up, given the nature of this particular policy area, where so much of what's important happens at the front line level. And that's obviously significantly influenced by what Antonio is saying, the management infrastructures they can create there. Thanks, Jody. Anything you want to add, Duke? Uh, no, thank you. So let's- you know, um, I, I do want to add that. Management flexibility and how do you use your resources doesn't translate to asking for more federal dollars. And I think that sometimes when you say management flexibility and how you use your resources, all people hear is, oh, they want more money. And I don't think so. I think there's a significant amount of money. We just need the flexibility on how to use it. Less compliance, less regulatory, less check in the box that you gave the same dollar to the right, right person you know, and that you have all of these administrative burdens that actually eliminate the possibility of you being um, flexible and you being creative because you're going to come down and you're going to get an audit that you're not complying with some, you know, rule that was established in the 1920s. And so, you know, I think we just have to get beyond that point. Thanks, Antonia. That's um, a really important additive um, contribution uh, to, to Jody's frame there. So um, Duke, when you think about um, what you've seen as some of the successes of the human services system being responsive um, in this pandemic and its 
in its you know, holistic way, including its economic repercussions. Um, maybe share some of your reflections uh, and also the ways in which we can, um, in partnership with the federal government, continue to accelerate that equitable recovery that we wanna see. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the most effective responses um, really did address the economic insecurity head on. We had the expansion, extension, and supplementation of unemployment insurance, we had direct cash assistance for families through the CARES grants. Um, we um, really uh, tried to tackle food insecurity by making meals free for all students, you know, for finally getting rid of the stigma um, of uh, school um, and after school meals and summer meals um, through the pandemic EBT. And we really addressed some of the natural disadvantages that households whose parents uh, have to physically go to work during the pandemic, right? Who, who weren't working from home and who lack adequate transportation through uh, pandemic EBT. I thought the increase in SNAP allotments um, and the 15% increase under the Biden administration uh, were really efficient both to help households as well as the economy. Under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, you know, they increased SNAP uh, allotments by 13%, and they found it was the most efficient stimulus uh, for the economy in addition to dramatically uh, increasing food security. Um, I think allowing virtual visits as part of the child welfare system was a really smart flexibility um, and one that I hope we can carry with us moving forward. And then I think the, the investment in childcare um, has done a number of things. One is it put a, a spotlight on a very fragile, broken system to begin with. Um, everyone finally woke up and said, we can't treat uh, people in the hospital unless they can drop their kids off at of childcare. Um, and so we have this huge both focus and investment. And I think those flexible pots of funds help providers, you know, direct investment to providers in most states. And those are women and minority owned businesses, you know, at least in Virginia, they are predominantly, um, as well as helping, you know, participants by waiving co-pays, extending absence days. Um, and in addition to investment and flexibility, um, I really thought the federal government did a great job uh, preventing some bad things from happening, right? It put a moratorium on evictions. I mean, I think this also shows a spotlight on the challenges we have for people day to day in making uh, their housing payments and the fragility of the low income housing system. So as we sort of turn to uh, the future, um, based on some of the experience that we've had in terms of success um, in the last 11 months. You know, I hope that we allow uh, summer EBT uh, as a standing option for the summer food service program. Um, right now, it is not an option. Um, and uh, I hope that we continue with policies that make uh, school uh, and other child nutrition meals more universal um, and get rid of some of that stigma. Um, I think we are seeing the power of increased SNAP benefits and staving off uh, food insecurity and hunger, and then all of the benefits that has around school readiness and uh, healthy workers in the workforce, et cetera. Um, I think it really speaks to we need a permanent change to increase in the SNAP allotments. Um, I think um, as we look at maybe the next stimulus bill and future investments in childcare funding, um, I think providing either a requirement or an incentive to stand up uh, a more supply of childcare in underserved communities um, or for uh, household compositions that are underserved, you know, people who work the night shift or um, infant and toddler care. Um, and, and I think we should really be thinking seriously in the recovery about what we can do to shore up our uh, labor market to make sure that the recovery isn't just for the middle and upper class like it was after the Great Recession, 
uh, that it's for all of our workers. You know, we were all, you know, uh, focused on AI and bots taking away all the low wage jobs, you know, before the pandemic. And so we, we kind of put that on the shelf, but that reality is still before us and perhaps even accelerated as we've relied more um, on, uh, on automation. So looking at a public jobs program and at very least leveraging our patchwork of workforce uh, to really focus on the things that we need as society, infrastructure, including broadband, green economy jobs, food security, and transportation. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to, I want to echo this because I think this principle of recovery for all workers will do so much. I also think when Duke's laying out all these detailed program pieces, to me, it's exciting because a year ago, one year ago, we would never have believed that the federal or state government would remove those kinds of administrative requirements. And they did it because they were focusing on outcomes. What are the outcomes we needed? And it moved fast, which is as somebody who's been in this field for 25 years, it's exciting because we have never been able to move and we've been able to change and get some of the crap out of the way so people can do their jobs. We need to keep that attitude going forward and focus on the outcomes we need for citizens. Thanks, Jody. Um, Antonia, you know, um, certainly build on that um, and maybe also just share a little bit about what this has meant for adaptations in, in practice. You, you know, you talked a bit about we can make the business adjustments um, on the ground, but maybe, you know, make that come alive a little bit for folks about like what that's entailed and, and how you've done it. Well, I think the first thing I did during the pandemic is just give people access. You know, access was a big deal. And, um, well, you know, the offices were technically not open to the public, although we kept some of our offices always open and we would continue to do that. But just giving people, like for the first time, we saw an 80% increase in our, in our SNAP program. Um, and that was, that was interesting because it was the first time that I think even the middle class who lost their jobs understood the importance of these programs because they had to apply and they've never had to apply before. So when you're able to be on, live in somebody else's shoes and you have a better understanding of why these programs are so important. I think that also when we have, when we look at the homeless population here in LA and the housing costs, um, we, you know, we can't just say it's all about the benefits. It's really all about how do you get someone to get the right level of job to get um, the right training, the right supports in order for them uh, to be able to even afford housing. So um, I love the moratorium. I thought that was important. We don't need to put more people out on the, on the homeless streets. But I also think that when we look at families as a whole, they, are, they have other issues that, you know, that most of these are working families, two adult families or a single adult that's working and have to put food on the table, make sure the kids go to school, make sure that they're able to pay for their rent. And so we're looking at, for the people that we can just through our business process, just give them the benefits that they need because that's all they need, then we'll do this business process redesign. For the people that need more supports, then we really want to put all the wraparound services, help them with housing, help them with food, help them with domestic violence, substance abuse, all of the other support services that are so, critical needed to stabilize these families. And, you know, mental health is a big issue that we have to address. Um, if it was a bigger issue before, it's now even bigger with the stress that people have of, you know, going to work and are they gonna be safe? And are they, you know, and where do they, where do they go when, they're, when they get the COVID? And so we're really focused on really, what does the family need? Just what do they need and how can we get it to them? Um, regardless of the regulations, regardless of the policy. Of course, we don't want to break any rules, but how do we use the funding to make sure that um, we provide holistic services to our families? Because most of these families are, are black and brown families that, um, you know, even student, uh, tutoring, we started a, a student tutoring program for our TANA population because parents are sending their kids to virtual schools, but these parents don't have the education in order to to help out. So it's even those little things when I talk about families, that's what I mean. Like what supports do they really need in order to stabilize their environment? Thanks a lot, Antonia. 
Um, so I'm going to take the direction now a little bit to thinking out to, and you've already done this um, because this is um, how you all um, are leaning in um, as leaders, but really to the future, right? What, what could be um, and what is the moment mean now um, to, to taking us there? And we've talked a bit about um, the intersection of uh, some policy issues that maybe traditionally we didn't think of as connected, um, or maybe we did, but we haven't acted as um, in that way, like how human services intersects with education policy or how human services intersects with tax policy, two issues that, um, that, that Duke has raised. And so um, I just wanted to offer up if anybody wants to add any other sectors or Im important pieces you wanna lift up about how policies work in tandem with each other across sectors and systems that we need to keep in the forefront if we're really to have an equitable recovery. And I'll just open this one up to anybody who wants to add anything on that point. You guys are all good. Tracy, this is yeah. Tracy, this is this is Duke. Just kind of a comment about you know you had mentioned, and I had talked a little bit about some tax policies before. Um, you know, one of one of the things we're doing in a couple of our local Department of Social Services is we're we're trying to integrate tax prepar preparation as a core service that we provide. You know, you can you can file your taxes anytime, not just tax season, and you can go back for EITC. Uh, for multiple years. And so doing that screening um, on uh, whether or not people have filed in the past and then offering that, you know, 11 months ago, we had offered it on site. Now we're you know, trying to offer it virtually. Um, and then I think even if we're not integrating it into our business processes, being very intentional about outreach. So we do a match with our state tax files to see who who filed for EITC, and you know we know everybody's income and household status as the as the cognizant agency over all the income support programs, um, and then testing different outreach strategies. We did an RS, RCT this year um, using texting outreach strategies. So I, I think, um, and, and then the other side of that is the how to how to utilize um, a refund. Um, can we really rethink what we're doing with individual development accounts? Can we match savings or match expenditures on key investments that help people rise out of poverty through education or asset creation or other strategies? Um, and then, you know, the other is, you know, really ensuring that there's affordable access to dependent care services. So, if you, you know, it's one thing to to be eligible for a credit, but if you don't have access to those services and, and you know, that's the health and human service responsibility. And I, and I know that um, a lot of those services are not available and not affordable to low income families. So just a little intersection there on the, on the tax side that you mentioned. I wanna jump in because the research is really clear on the tax policies. The Earned Income Tax Credit is the most effective anti-poverty program we have ever passed in this country. And the irony is it hasn't been administered through the Health and Human Services system. And so what Duke is talking about is a key leadership framework, right, of integration. He's saying, well, that hasn't been in my swim lane, but I know the policy is making a huge difference in people's lives. How do we decrease barriers to access? Because right now, if you don't know how to fill out your taxes, you're going to these voluntary tax preparation sites and they vary tremendously around the country in terms of how well they're resourced. And so for people in the public sector to do what Duke's talking about would just think holistically, try to integrate across the boxes that are how people have defined your job and really bring resources together. That's the kind of leadership we need um, to really take advantage of the policies that have been creating the outcomes that we want. But I, I'll add to that because I think that I go back to the program connections, right? Because I heard that the federal government was thinking on the earning of tax credit for a family with two kids to give them 3,600 lump sum and then the rest in $300 on a monthly basis. Well, then those $300 on a monthly basis gets what? Con 
it counts as earned income. And so earned income might cancel some of the, the, the programs that you currently are eligible for. So when I say look at it holistically, I mean like this might be great earned income tax credit that's going up, but if it doesn't, if we don't look at the implications that it has on other programs, I feel like we're just like swimming without really having a course uh, for, for which um, we look at through these lenses and make sure that we're moving towards the right uh, pathway. So really the integration of programs I've learned the hard way in LA uh, is really important because a minimum wage can cancel 10,000 families for $1, 10,000 families in SNAP, right? If we go through this earned income tax, we might lose families in TANF. And so the integration of programs is becoming, to, um, to me, becoming a more and more important issue that we just can't ignore. We really have to make sure that one program doesn't cancel another. Yeah, and I think your, your point there, Antonia, on um, really understanding the unintended consequences um, has to be, um, you know, at the at front and center of how we're thinking about policy pieces. And certainly, um, as I think something that was in the chat earlier around really the critical importance about asset building, right? So you can't build assets if you have a benefit cliff consistently keeping you from um, really achieving either higher income, but then let alone creating kind of the asset um, and closing that wealth gap. And so I think those are um, overarching principles that I think we're trying hard at APHSA to bring to the forefront of these are the kind of considerations we have to put front and center as we're thinking through um, the policies and and really what is an opportunity to bridge um, with openings that have really the pandemic has created um, for us to 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 be um, tackling um, and really dismantling some of those inequities and, and moving ahead. So I'm going to ask a last um, question um, around kind of embedding equity in everything we do um, uh, to all of you, um, and then we'll open it up for questions um, from the audience. So again, for those of you who are listening in, please feel free to um, put questions in the um, Q and A um, section, um, and if you happen to capture them in the chat, we'll um, we'll, we'll get those too. Uh, but let me ask this question, um, and I'll I'll start maybe um, again, Jody, um, with you, and then uh, move kind of from your big macro um, observations um, to to um, Duke and then Antonia. And really, the question is this: um, both Napa and um, APHSA have embraced um, and are trying very hard in our intentional work, um, this call to action for the public sector to do the work that's necessary to essentially rewire our systems to promote equity in everything we do. And I think it would be helpful for everyone to hear from, the vantage, from your vantage points, what are the steps needed for local, state, and federal partners to work together to instill equitable policies and practices as our default, right? The way of doing business. Um, and we know this is gonna require that we build more muscle um, around rules and processes and norms to make it a reality. And I think it would be really helpful from your experiences for you to give some reflections to the group on that. So I'll start with you, Jody. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked this question. I've been having a lot of conversations with friends of mine, particularly those who are African-American who really fear that all this attention to equity is going to fade. Um, and I think given the legacy of white people running systems in this country, there's fear to be, that's a legitimate fear. Um, I think this is lifetime work. Um, the former president, as people may recall, um, was trying to shut down the training around anti-racism and intersectionality in higher education and every government contractor. And in that announcement, he said, well, this is un-American. And as an adult educator, I took a lot of, it was, that made me very angry. <laughs> but when I thought about it more, I realized actually it is a little anti-American. We have not done a good job in this country in the past in really owning, naming, and making a commitment to undoing the legacy of slavery and mass extermination that we have, white people have led in this country. And so I think the moment is now to change that history, to live up to our spouse values. And as Duke said, 
equity is not the same as equality. So if we have an espoused value in dealing with the social inequity in the society, that work has to be done on multiple levels. It has to be done individually. White people need to understand the world, that the water we're swimming in and that we've always been swimming in. We need to do our work interpersonally and understand the different experiences of people who are unlike you or your family. We need to, in the roles we all play, a deal with the organizational uh, white supremacy that's embedded in operations and practices. Everything from who do you contract with to who are the vendors that you get your catering from to what are your HR practices? And then the institutional and the policy levels as well. So we're all going to be trying to do things that have never been done before, but it's about shifting power. And I really feel strongly that the future of the country, of democracy depends on us dealing with this for once and for all. And it's gonna take the rest of our lives to make progress because it's been a long time in, in the institutions and the way we work. Thanks, Jody. Duke? So I think about it in sort of three, uh, three very clear steps, identification, understanding, and acting. So I think as leaders, um, at all levels, uh, we have to commit to doing the data analysis that shows us where we have equity issues and then set targets for improvement and be very transparent and hold ourselves accountable and to hold one another accountable. I think that includes our service outcomes and outputs. That includes uh, pay scale uh, um, with our own organizations and those with whom we contract and, um, and then uh, in communities and states as a whole. Um, and it gets into things like contracts and funding formulas. Um, so I think we, we need a, a real commitment for that ongoing data analysis. And then I think we've got to listen more. You know, there's a lot of opportunities to do that and they're all important to embrace. Uh, from interpersonal relationships to observation in communities and in, in how we deliver services to focus groups, advisory committees. Um, you know, human-centered design is about listening first, and we've got to commit to that as a core principle in how we do our business and a core value for our organizations. And then a focus on organizational culture being really intentional about equity, but also about diversity and inclusion. Um, I think they are all different, but doing a good job with diversity and inclusion will help you uh, do a better job with equity. Embed DEI goals and strategies into your organization's strategic plan. Lift them up, make them important, talk about them, be, be accountable. Um, and then sort of that ongoing training, education, dialogue opportunities, um, and really uh, fostering this not as a singular top-down initiative. Um, it is not about having a committee. <laughs> it's about uh, the way we go about uh, doing our work and interacting as human beings. And finally, there's nothing like concrete action. Um, you know, the very first thing that we decided to tackle um, was pay equity, doing a pay equity analysis um, so we could demonstrate to our uh, team that we're taking this seriously. Um, um, and the second thing is our funding formula to local departments of social services. You know, there's nothing like uh, money um, to get people's attention uh, and to reflect the values of an organization. Um, and then sort of looking beyond our bureaucracy really thinking about prioritizing and investing um, in people and communities uh, early. So that prenatal through five, I think really has the best return on investment. And so putting an equity lens on our outcomes and outputs prenatal through five and focusing on those systems first. Um, so we did you know, a series of listening sessions, hunger town halls, uh, sessions on um, maternal and child health around the Commonwealth over the last couple of years. 
and we're coming out, you know, I'm proud to say with a doula benefit um, in our Medicaid program. Um, and uh, we're ensuring that every community has a hunger action coalition that's maximizing the opportunities to address systemic issues and food insecurity. Just a couple examples. And finally, in the policy making, building an equity assessment into the policy process. And, and you know, APHSA did this, and, you know, Ann and uh, Matt and Tracy. And, you know, I've really seen the power of being intentional about that. And, um, and so we're building all, an equity analysis into our policy making process uh, to help build, like Jody said, to build systemically for the future and not have this be um, a one time. Uh, effort. Thank you. Thanks, Duke. Antonia? Sure. I, I also, um, when I think about the diversity and inclusion from the program and then from the staff, they're two different things. But from the program, I really look at, you know, we have an immigration issue. People are afraid to uh, apply for benefits because the impact of immigration, uh, some of it's real, some of it is a myth. And so we we're trying to spend some time here to educate our our customers of what's real and what's not real. And, um, and then we have a diverse community here in LA. And so the way that you talk to the African-American community is different than you talk to the uh, Latino community and the Asian community um, and the Armenian community. So how do you get the message to the right um, uh, uh, individuals in a way that they can really understand? So cultural, um, um, is one of the things that we're focusing on. And also the CBOs, I heard somebody say the CBOs have a you know, role to play. They're the trusted advisors in a lot of these communities. And how do we work with the CBOs and the faith-based organizations um, who can help us? Um, and the one thing I do wanna invest in, in this year and with our programs is youth, right? If we can start now with our transition at youth and they, it'll help them set them up better when they become adults and hopefully um, uh, we can work towards that. And then I'm gonna echo what uh, Duke said on the policy changes that uh, we need to focus on the policy changes that enhance and support families um, and not maintain them in the you know, lowest, they have to be the, the, uh, the poorest of the poor and not even the working poor have access to these services. We've really got to change that. And then from a workforce, we. You know, we have um, we have employ employees who you know struggle with who should deserve these benefits because they're they're not making a whole lot of money either, um, and so they're figuring they're giving all these programs to these families when they have to come to work, and and so we have some cultural shifts to do in our department as well to make sure that people understand. And one of the struggles that we were having is during the pandemic is that the eligibility workers were not seeing themselves as doing eligibility work but doing paperwork because the client wasn't in front of them. And you have to remind them that every, every, every application you process is a family or an individual that's being served. And so that has been one of the things we're working on here because we wanna make sure that we don't lose the empathy um, that our workforce needs in order to so continue to support our families. So we have a, we have a double uh, struggle going on and we're gonna continue to work towards that. Thanks, Antonia. Thanks to all of you. Those were, I think, really helpful, um, both reflections, but really uh, uh, starting to graph a, a way forward um, in, this, in this work. And one of the questions we did get um, was around talking more about that um, connection with community-based organizations that Antonia just mentioned. And I'll just, um, you know, add that I think it is core to centering family, that you're centering family in place with trusted organizations and community-based um, uh, places that are um, really trusted agents um, of the delivery systems that we all provide. We often talk as a monolith of public sector human services, as if it, it exists in just the agencies, and we all who work in the space know it is not, right? We rely on many organizations um, and other uh, uh, in businesses as well, right? Private sector and um, community-based sector to really make it work. And I think part of the systems work really has to be 
the intentionality around that um, and how do we do it in a way that that's going to be most effective. Um, but I did have another question that's aligned to the community based organizations that came through in the registrations, um, which was around um, the, the role of the faith community in creating a resilient and equitable um, nation. And so I didn't know if anybody wanted to add anything on community based organizations or the role of the faith community in the work you're doing. You know, I'll jump in um, just to say, so this is something that's always been unique about the United States compared to other countries, this robust private sector nonprofit faith world, right? And that communities here naturally turn to themselves and we had a system where these organizations could be created, mutual aid and support. And over time, those have been institutionalized. I think to me, one of the important things for people in the public sector to remember is that nonprofit organizations are not really contractors. And in the last 30 years, we've used that language and we've thought about people who are providing core services similar to the people who you contract to get staples and pens. Procurement of those kinds of things are totally different than engaging with nonprofit organizations. And I think actually the public management rhetoric around competition and um, just that whole orientation really has decreased the effectiveness of the system. So I just think it's critical that the public sector realize these organizations are partners. As Antonio mentioned, they have legitimacy with families, but they also have deep expertise. And um, they have a different business model, which means that sometimes they don't like the public sector very much because they feel very beholden to you. And I think the more like, as Duke was saying, it's about listening. It's about listening to organizations. And again, I will take my hat off to APHSA um, because under Tracy's leadership, you have made strategic partnerships with other national associations of nonprofit organizations, such as the Alliance for Children and Families. And more of that has to happen because the nonprofit and faith-based organizations are essential in the work of this system. And we've gotten in our own way a lot in how we think about them, I think. Thanks, that's really helpful. Any other reflections before I move on to the next question from the audience? The only thing I will add I, is that we over-regulate them too. Yeah. Right, with nonprofits, we over-regulate CBOs. We make it so difficult for them to provide the service because they have all of this administrative requirements that count government puts on them. So we have to work a little bit on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I this is Duke. I, I do think Antonio's comment about um, both CBOs and faith-based uh, partners as being trusted spokespersons, you know, no matter how hard I try and how much training, you know, we are still the people that come and take the kids out of your house, you know, <laughs> and we just, it's, it's hard to overcome, you know, uh, and I think Jody gave a nice sort of reflection, you know, really a history of, systemic racism um, in the public sector. And it's really hard to, uh, to unwind that. And it's gonna take a really long time. And we need uh, trusted voices to communicate the important services. And you know, in the pandemic, it's been so important. You know, we've had uh, a number of or, you know, calls, uh, webinars with faith-based organizations, just simple things like, this is 2 one one here's our COVID app, please get your vaccines, you know, help us carry that message because they're going to believe you more than they're going to believe us. And, I, and so in addition to service delivery, I think that's a really uh, vital role uh, that they, they provide for us in Virginia. Thanks, Duke. So one of the other questions we received was, what do you think it will take to finally address the benefits cliff and committing to actual economic security through policy and program design? Big question. Duke, I know you have a comment on this. Yeah, I, <laughs> Emma, what time is this webinar over? <laughs> um, so I, I think, um, you yeah, know, the benefit cliff is a function of federal policy. So one of two things have to happen. One, we have to change the federal policies, which looks like 
changing, you know, combination of changing earned income disregards and aligning, uh, aligning the exit criteria uh, to be more akin to a living wage. Um, uh, or it's, um, you know, cashing out some of these existing programs um, and looking at a different model or models through innovation. Um, and I, and I think, uh, but you, you cannot overcome the benefit cliff without um, changing the federal rules because that is what creates it. So. And I would like to add that we saw during the pandemic that when the federal government wants to move quickly, they can. Right. And so I think I, the benefit cliff and the, uh, the rebuilding the, the economy go hand in hand and that this is an opportunity for maybe us to, to leverage the opportunity, change some of those things that cause the benefit cliff so that we could have a robust economy because it is uh, important for all of us uh, and especially for our families. So I, I don't want us to let government go back to the, you know, the, the snail's pace. I mean, they have the ability, they can move quickly and we should um, push this, especially now um, with the benefit cliff. So I'm working on trying to figure it out here in LA for our families and what policies we need to change. Happy to share. I'm sure you have some Duke as well. I think we have to go holistically on this that the time is right now if we're going to work on the economy to look deeply at how to say eliminate the benefit cliff. I would just add, this is a policy issue we have been talking about for 40 years. Mm -hmm. The Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank is deep in this work. It's technical and it's totally fixable. And we must act on this at the federal level because that's where it comes from. Thanks, Jody. And I was going right where you went, which is there are some really critical partners um, um, and economists that are, um, are, are you know, right with us in terms of this is something we have to fix and it is fixable. And so um, I think we really need collectively, right, across national organizations and from the ground up, from local state um, leaders to really um, bring this forward. And, you know, part of the conversations and us coming together with um, Napa on this webinar was also to be really be able to lift up for so many of our federal partners how critical this is um, and uh, try to find some pathways uh, forward. So I really appreciate all of your comments on that. Um, I'm going to ask um, one more uh, question here um, and then be sure to leave a little bit of time um, for Glary Gl Glickman, who's going to come on and just share some reflections about what's what's next and what we um, hope to do um, through um, Napa on this um, on this series. Um, but I will ask a question that came up about um, kind of digging a little bit deep deeper into how can we improve cultural competence and outreach and service provision? And I think Antonia um, touched upon some um, aspects of kind of what that looks like um, in, in communities, right? Certainly place-based um, and centered in, into what a particular community looks like, but any reflections on that about what we need to do, um, maybe more from an investment standpoint and, and federal support? I think it goes back to like the the nonprofits can do stuff that government can't. Um, and so, and they have the cultural competency because they work with these communities day in and day out. And I think we have to empower them to help us reach out to our families and we have to loosen some of our requirements so that they can help families uh, more. So I think that I, and also we need to educate our staff a little bit as well as the importance of understanding different cultures and um, and different aspects of, of, of families. So uh, I really believe that the area for cultural competency um, that we need to invest on our CBOs to us get through some of those issues that we're facing because they, they are trusted advisors and we're not as Duke said. Yeah, just to, to build on that, you know, two things. One is, you know, we need to spend more money I mean, the, the bottom line is, you know, uh, even something, not even getting to cultural competency, but just having, you know, appropriate languages and having the access to appropriate languages, you know, language line is not good customer service. 
it's the last resort, not the first resort, right? So having uh, both staff and materials in multiple languages, it's a difficult investment to make, uh, but it's a small step toward uh, cultural competency. And then I do think that staff training and partner organizations, that's an ongoing body of work. And I think the federal government has a role to play um, in recognizing the importance of cultural competency when it sets up the standards around evidence-based practices. You know, this has really been clear in the uh, Families First Clearinghouse. Families First is the Prevention Services Act. Uh, where you can provide prevention services to a family with a child at risk of uh, entering the foster care system. You know, they've got an evidence base, big national programs, cost a lot of money to evaluate them, but there's none that are, you know, specific to, you know, indigenous populations and other, other sort of cultures. Um, and I think you can replicate that in the SNAP Ed Clearinghouse and the Department of Labor's Clearinghouse, right? We all want evidence-based practices, but we need to make room in federal policy for adaptations and cultural competency. Thanks. I just want to echo that. Yay, yay, rah, rah, 100%. There's a reification of a certain kind of evidence that is studying people who look like me. And we have really missed the boat on this from a research perspective. And now policy is following suit. And so we must address that and not get misled to think that that's the only kind of practice that's legitimate. I just, I think that's critical. Thank you, Jody. Um, really important point. And important also as we think about what's the synergy and possibility of practitioners alongside our academic and research um, and evidence partners um, as well, that you know, this this is something, um, and I think one of the reasons we wanted to bring NAPA um, and uh, NAPHSA together is because NAPA also really has these strong connections um, among universities and colleges, um, and um, and a lot of institutions that provide um, critical research support. But we have to be, um, you know, bridging the divide between the practice, the people's experience, practitioners' experience and needs, and what, um, and how we've been thinking about um, research, um, and really making sure that we're doing that through an equity lens. So I think those are all really important points. Um, I'm going to um, share just a couple of things because I'm not going to get to every question that was um, was asked, but I did want to highlight a couple of things for folks just as additional resources. I think along the way, someone was asking more about. Um, you know, what were the waivers and flexibilities you, you experienced during COVID-19? And I know that Duke um, in particular mentioned um, uh, some of them. Um, we have a report at APHSA um, that we did um, with uh, the generous support of the Kellogg Foundation, um, really looking kind of real time at some of the um, waivers and flexibilities and what they meant for states um, and also starting to look forward to what those might mean um, for the future. Um, and so uh, when I turn it over to Gary or if one of my team members is able to, we'll um, put that back in the chat so folks can um, link to that uh, report. I think it will be helpful. Um, there was also some further questions. Jody mentioned the human services value curve, which has been really an orientation or a lens that for um, almost a decade now or about a decade, um, human service um, leaders across the country have been using to really think about this orientation from what we might describe as a very regulative system that is about compliance and and um, you know, and just meeting um, outputs to how we have a much more generative conversation that really is family um, and community centered. And we have some resources as well um, on our site about um, how, how that could be a helpful lens. And I think what is really interesting to me is so many leaders who've been in the space have really um, embedded that in the way that they're thinking that we talk a little bit less about it as a thing, the human services value curve, and it really is the orientation. How do we orient ourselves to really be about having generative impact, which brings all of these pieces together, talks about the partnerships that you really need to create it and flips your thinking, right, from I'm delivering this set of a particular program to the systems um, level of work and how you actually create that. 
Um, so with that, I want to thank um, Duke, Antonia, and Jody for a really robust conversation, Terry for kicking us off, and I am going to now turn it over to Gary Glickman, who's going to share a little bit about what's next. But thank you so much to our panelists. That was absolutely terrific. Gary? Thank you, Tracy. And I also want to thank Jody, Antonia, and Duke for participating in this. This has been a um, terrific panel. You guys have been able to articulate a lot of the themes that we've been thinking about. And when I, when I say we, um, in addition to having worked with Tracy many years over the past, uh, I chair the social standing panel on social equity for the National Academy of Public Administration. And we've been fairly active in trying to look at what can we do to help move to a more equitable society. And so um, before I get to the next steps, let me just share a couple of observations <clears throat> from this panel. One is, there's a number of words I was trying to keep track, I didn't keep count, uh, but, but words that kept count coming up. Complexity, compliance, innovation, innova investment, um, holistically. And when I think about those words, and the purpose for which we're doing these series, as Tracy mentioned, which is to try to highlight to a new administration, maybe there are some areas that can, can be looked at for improvement. I've come up with um, really four areas. The first is a redesign of, as Jody put it, the institutionalized patchwork of programs. And I think Duke stated as well as needing to look at holistically all these different programs and figuring out how can we provide not just support, but a pathway uh, for people who have been left behind. And so um, that's one key area. And looking at that from the standpoint of innovation and flexibility, um, and really, I think Antonia, you put it, um, looking at systems that build families not maintain their status, the supports that currently maintain their status. So that was the first one. The second one is really looking at a wholesale redesign of the grants management process. I mean, this process, um, and I had the opportunity to work in past, not the last two administrations ago, um, at grants management. And this whole process of grants management is built upon a mistrust between the various parties. And every time there's a problem, we add another accountability item versus looking at, well, what's the real problem? What's the magnitude of this problem? And looking beyond the zero tolerance mentality. And that grants management process filters down to the uh, faith-based organizations and others that we're talking about that really help. And so looking at how do we move this from a compliance-based system to an outcome-based system and demand accountability on outcomes, not on how many pencils you've bought and the minutia of, of how we manage grants today. The fair area is really building a social infrastructure that creates pathways to equity. And so what I mean by that, Duke, Duke uh, talked about this at various times, is the need for investment. Well, we talk about infrastructure. We all, every administration talks about these huge infrastructure bills. They're gonna fix potholes, fix bridges, things like that. What we need to think about is a social infrastructure that builds pathways to equity and the bridges to equity. Um, in addition to just the hard uh, infrastructure that we normally talk about. And that would include some of the other parts of, of the holistic approach that we look at, not just human services, but health, transportation, um, mental health, childcare, substance abuse, and all the things that have been talked about today. And then the fourth one, I think Duke probably put this most eloquently when he said we need to spend more money. What we need to really look at is we spend a lot of money, but are we spending it right? Are we getting results? And 
Duke has done a tremendous job in his state, I know, of looking at data and evidence and trying to build toward more equity through evidence. And we need to continue that, emphasize that, and also look at how we spend that money to get back to that whole, the redesign of the uh, institutionalized patchwork. Jody, I, I love that phrase, thank you. I'm gonna keep using that. So what's next is that we intend to continue this, this, these discussions. And in addition to APHSA, we also wanna link in some of the other sectors to try to get to more of this holistic view. So looking at the patchwork of criminal justice systems, healthcare systems, um, housing and transportation systems, it's going to be impossible to solve an equity issue um, if we look at it from the silos that are currently existing versus a holistic approach as, as you've all talked about. You know, one thing that, that COVID has done is it has highlighted um, how the disparities have affected communities, but it's also highlighted how the communities themselves have systemic inequities that need to be solved. And so um, you look at, I think it was Antonia um, that said that they're providing um, tutoring services at the local level. That is so important, but in a wealthy community, it's taken for granted. So why is that? It makes no sense. It makes sense that the communities are the ones, and, and Antonia, I commend you because from my work at the uh, federal level um, with Tracy and others, um, I think we need a rule. And do, do you fit in this, that anybody that makes policy at the federal level that influences local, policy, local practice needs to have worked at a local practice first because there's just too much of a disconnect between what we think is right versus what really works. And so we're gonna continue this series. We're gonna continue, we're gonna expand it. We're also going to, um, we're in the process of planning right now our social equity leadership conference in June. It'll be early June. And this is gonna be a major topic of, of uh, discussion of how do we integrate all these different resources? What suggestions do we have? And trying to get more participation possibly from the new administration in meeting these new challenges. I know you look at the executive orders that have been, that have been issued, uh, especially the ones on social equity, there's a tremendous commitment toward this. And so now it's a matter of how do we actually implement it to make change. And then the last thing I'll mention is that we are, and, and Duke, I'd love to talk to you more about this, uh, within NAPA, within the Social Equity Committee, we are trying to create a framework that will allow for consistent assessment of social equity um, impacts across a number of different programs. And the purpose of this tool that we're trying to create is first of all at the federal level to give them a way of implementing it through more executive action, but, but also to have more of a consistent voice across um, state and local governments as well as other practitioners. So that they have a tool that they can look at and use as they see fit in their own communities. And so we're, we're launching that and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing more about that shortly. So thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Jody, and Antonia, Duke, and Terry for supporting this effort. And I look forward to seeing all of you in the future. Tracy. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, thank you everybody for joining. We will be sending out um, a link to the recording to everybody who participated. And just thanks again um, and have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.